here is that everyone here should be able to take this and actually, if they want, follow along. I can say when we get to the build root stage, it'll be kind of like I get you to the start of it and you fire off the commands, but it's compiling software, so it's going to take a while. So that's why I have some of this stuff cached already to show you the output so that we can kind of skip over that step. But this is literally like you would go, you would download this tar file, you'd verify the GPG signature, and then you would explode it on the file system. So like I have a second hard drive on here, and I just have uh, a couple different instances of the so we use this one. So like this is an unpacked version of Builder. And like I can literally get started in it just by using the normal commands that you would use to compile a kernel. Like I run make menu config, and it gives me a menu that I can actually open. Yeah, I don't need the tools for that. And maybe I need, you know, ISC, DHCP. But really, if I want DNS and DHCP, easier to just get rid of bind and use DNS mask, and then I can you know, get But it gives you some mechanisms for doing that. Don't worry, we'll cover this. Like I said, first we're going to start with the fat mechanism. And because the big thing, the big takeaway is that all that container images are is an image. Now I realize that it sounds like a circular definition, but think about it. Has anyone here done like a Docker export of a command? Okay. What if that outputs is a tar file? And it's there's a very good reason why it outputs a tar file. Because, and this may be mind-blowing for some people, that's all a Docker image is. It's a tar file. You've been handed this ecosystem where like you're used to using this centralized registry because at one point in time the idea of moving tar files around is hard. But that's what that's what Docker is doing. It's it's moving tar files around and it's giving you a centralized registry for storing those tar files and potentially layering multiple tar files on top of each other. And all that an export or a save in that case is doing is collapsing all of those squashed it. So what we're going to worry about doing is creating those base tar images of an actual host, of an actual container that we want to do. And it's surprisingly simple to do with the general purpose Linux distribution. Like uh, in the case of Debian, so Debian, Ubuntu, you know, Mint, all these other kind of flavors of that, you can use a command called dev bootstrap to do that. In the case of CentOS, Scientific Linux, Red Hat, Fedora, all of the like RPM-based distros, it's even easier because Yum will do that for you natively. So if I were to say, hey, give me a new temporary directory, which I have to spell name temp correctly, give me a new temporary directory in temp. Give me a new temporary directory. It creates this new directory for me, and I'm now ready to go. So let's say that I want to have a small Apache container. You know, Apache is a pretty common piece of software. Um, how do I get started doing that? Well, I can say, instead of just yum install HTTPD, which HTTPD is the name of the Apache package in rel flavored things, we're going to give it one more option of install root equals that. Now, this command is going to fail. And I'm going to make it fail, and then I'm going to explain why. Um, because there's nothing one in that directory right now. Also, I have a bunch of other things that are there. But if we were to go into that directory, we'll see that some directories have been created. It's gone through, and within that directory, it's started to create the actual infrastructure it needs to support a Red Hat based distribution. And you know, in this case it was complaining because like I've got uh, you know some problems with my repositories. And admittedly I don't want to actually just use all of the generic repositories on here because like this is a laptop. If I were to look at everything that I have here with Young Repo list, like I've got Dropbox and I've got you know, RPM Fusion and you know, Chrome and all these other things that I really don't need. So it makes sense to go through and say, okay, 
we're going to disable all repos. And then I'm going to enable the repo Fedora and enable the repo updates. It's really weird.
because our goal is to never have you logging into the Linux distro in the first place. We want to get you to the point where you're doing API calls for things so that uh, you're making changes to your infrastructure program. Now, all of these things are actually installing, and as promised now, we're building out this whole file system. So, like at this point, I can, one, to root myself into that path, you know, if I have the actual access, and you know, now I'm here, and, like because it's a true root, and I don't have a path set, um, actually, do I even have the PSS on yet? It should let me bounce out. Now this this gets into one of the interesting tricks with this is you know uh, some or some folks who were sitting through yeah, the config is going to be there IP is going to be there because again none of these commands are there because HTTP doesn't depend on them which also in a normal situation you shouldn't need to look at the IP address on the interface inside of the container because that should be exposed through some other mechanism like you should be able to see it through a Docker inspect. We're looking at the metadata on a rocket container through metadata service, like all those things are interesting. But like getting back to doing something useful with this, if I then take and say, and actually I will go one step further. I'm gonna go into Etsy and I'm going to say, echo, welcome to container days X into uh, a file. And you know, we have everything here. And you know, 
I can go in and say, cat out container days. So you can see this is the actual image that I created. And like with any general purpose distro, or like using uh, like Alpine, uh, you can now take and do additional things with this. So, you know, I could yum, install things from here. So, actually, I can't because I didn't include yum in my basic. Now, think about the, the implication of that. That's pretty powerful. Because now that means that additional software can't be added to the system. You have to make a conscientious decision as the administrator to do something like that. It also means that um, when I go to, if I try to use that as a from, I can only add explicit directories and explicit files. I'm not going to be able to just kind of YOLO and now yum install Ruby into it as well. Ruby wasn't there because Ruby wasn't intended to be there initially. Now, RPM is definitely going to be there, so you could still pull in individual RPM files and explicitly do like RPM UVH and install them. The same way that with, in the case of Debian, you could do a DPK, DPKG install and act, install actual dev files, but um, it, it's giving you different layers of control about how all this stuff is. Now, I want to show you another interesting side effect of this. So you saw that I did that Docker run command. If I pull off bin bash, you're going to encounter an error message that you don't normally encounter in Docker. No command specified. Now, when you think about writing a Docker file, it's true. We didn't specify a command. There's an easy solution to this. Thing. I can actually go into, say, Make temp. Dash D again, pick a new spot. And I'm going to create a document.
that I can then get onto stage two, which is where I then compile my init RAM FS and do all these other things. A stage three is just saying, hey, we've made a bunch of assumptions for you, sensible defaults, so you can just download this tar file and start compiling all of the other stuff in the distro from there. Point where I plug in real fast. Um, but the, the takeaway is that you, any tar file system of a Linux host can be a root doc. Um, now, the other way that folks more commonly will do this sort of stuff is they would have like that tar file system on the host, and rather than doing the import, they might have a Docker file that just says has this magic name in of from scratch, and then like <coughs> add temp gen2 dot tar, put a key into that, you know, and, and do some, some things that way. Also a valid way of doing it, it's just uh, having the raw tar file with no metadata is important because that means that that pattern you can use with any containerization method. Now, this artifact that you create, you can use with LXC, or you can use that with let me contain that, or you can use that with system DNS. It's not something that's embargoed within one technology. So now you're not forced into something that you don't necessarily, like if you don't like the way that it's going, you have an option to then use other things. Now, um, so as I was saying, this is also something that you can do with Alpine. Uh, in the case of Alpine Linux, they have a few uh, tar files up here that you can download. They also have like an ISO image that you can use, and the ISO image would work as well. Um, so these are things where you know you can kind of start from an 87 meg image, which is you start from there and then you can APK install all the pieces that you actually want. And what a lot of this is is this is a head. -based. This is actually teaching you the things that you didn't know were happening behind the scenes with the Linux distro for the last 20 years. Because this is actually how Linux distros used to work. Like if you wanted a piece of software, you compiled it and you ran it. Because there wasn't a, a binary package manager. That, you know, that was the idea behind like the ports tree in FreeBSD, is that, you know, and actually the portage tree in Gentoo. The portage in Gentoo will actually compile the software from the most recent sources. So it's not, you're never in a boat where you're like, oh man, I really wish that the developers would just get off their ass and produce this new RPM so that I could finally use what I want to use. Like, it actually is enabling you to do that. And that's why it's different from a lot of Linux situations. Now, I think that this is a good transition to actually go over to the stuff I was saying I was gonna talk about building. So, in the case of
What was that? X configure? Uh, well, there's X config. There's also a GTK config, um, but I forget what it is because one just uses the what? Uh, like, yes, it probably is gconfig. Uh, yes, it's gconfig. Uh, so, oh, but I don't have the right version of gtk that expects. So we go back to the tall thing of curses always works. Um, <laughs> so build root, as you know, I mentioned very early on, more people have walked in saw this right Build root is an SDK for building a Linux system. It is for building a real entire Linux distribution. It's actually used to build the distribution OpenWRT, which is pretty neat. Because whereas I was telling you before about how you can use Alpine to as this base image and then you can install additional stuff that you want, for anyone who's worked with OpenWRT, like which is this router distribution. It's used, it was originally like a replacement for the Linksys WRT 54G home routers. So like you could run your own full like router and unlock a lot of capabilities. But this thing is meta to the point where you can actually even build IPKG, OPKGs, and RPMs of all of the individual files in this as well. So you can actually even build your own customized, containerized Linux distribution exactly how you see fit. Which, admittedly, getting to that point is probably beyond the scope of what a lot of people here are interested in doing. But right now, there is kind of a vacuum. If you go to the existing containerization registries, Quay included, Quay is the one that you know, CoreOS runs in ministers, there's not a lot of minimal and that means that because of that vacuum, there is room for someone, potentially someone with a good business model around it too, to provide curated content, curated up-to-date content around these things. And my hope is that someone in this room finds a way of turning that into a successful business model. Because that's something that I want to do. Like, or I want to consume those people. I'm sure everyone else does too. Like, I don't want to be stuck going, okay, I need to run a log stash container. So I go here, and then uh, let me find it. Well, I'm going to say, and I get back a bunch of things. I've got uh, at least 10 pages worth of stuff. Which one of these do I use? So there is one that's stamped out in the main Docker library. But, you know, there are these other ones that have way more use and way more stars. And how do I tell what the difference between them is? How do I know what that curation is? And like, when it gets to the point of this one, like, there's a little bit of an understanding problem. Like, I'm, I'm gonna, walk through it here to make sure that everyone can do this, but like if you wanted to know what was happening, you'll notice that like it doesn't follow the normal path of like having the Docker file tab at the top of the lot of the Fortunately, they're producing a link here so that you can see this. But you know, I also mentioned yesterday in, in the keynote that it gets into this game of seeing how deep have to go. So now I need to find the Java 7 JRE container because that has some other arbitrary commands that are being executed on my behalf. <laughs> and in reality, let's think about this here. The JRE is self-contained. It has no dependencies besides GWC. That means I know the JDK is 235 megs basically. I know Logstash you were to pull down the jar files for it, it's about 20 megs. I know glibc is about a meg and a half. That means that if the container that I pulled down for this is larger than 300 megs, there is stuff in there I don't need. There is stuff in there that is beyond my area of concern that I now need to contain, or at the very least know about so that it's there. And how do I get to the point of then auditing all of this and knowing what's in 
that's one of the other reasons why, being the control freak that I am, I like walking through a lot of this stuff. Now, getting back to real usable things, um, let me do this. So I'm, I'm just going to remove the config file. So this is like I just untarded. So if I go back in and type make, then you can take again. It's going to have a bunch of default options. Like it's going to build for i386, which chances are you're actually using AMD64, which this is one peeve of mine that they call it x86-64, but really it's AMD64. But you can get to the point of even optimizing this for your architecture as well. So now you can have code that is designed to run on your exact chipset. So you can squeeze every last bit of um, on top of that, go into the tool chain, you can even choose the version of libc. So, you know, one of the one of the annoyances with Alpine Linux is that it uses a libc version called Musil. One of the annoyances with uh, BusyBox, if you were to do a Docker pull BusyBox, actually, I think I have. Is that BusyBox is by default built against uh, MicroLibc. And just, you know, the raw version of that is built against MicroLibc. So if there are LibC calls that are missing from MicroLibc or don't work the way that I expect them to with my application, despite the fact that my application may be statically compiled and may be minimal, it might not work with the minimal container that's curated upstream, which means I'm still back at the point of having to do all this over again. So, here I can go in and I can say, actually, I want to use full glibc. Not only that, I don't want to use 219, I want to use 220, and I want a newer version of being utils, and I want to compile a newer version of glibc. There is a whole lot of tunable pieces here. Now, as uh, Peter Parker was told, with great power comes great responsibility. And, you know, there's probably a lot of tunables here that people don't care about. And it's totally great to not care about that. Um, but for other things, like in the system configuration, what in its system do you want? We're talking about Docker. We don't want it in its system. And if you don't have folks logging in, you know, the password encoding doesn't matter. But for the hell of it, let's not use MD5. <laughs> That's a good place to start. Um, and now, there's a bunch of these options down here which I'll touch on in a few minutes because that's where it really gets interesting. You get a lot of awesome power. Like, but we also don't need a kernel. Now, the default output is a tar of the root file system. Huh, their sensible output is exactly what we want in our case. Cool, I don't have to do anything. Uh, so at this point, we're down to saying, what packages do we want? So, by default, it does not have things like bash and all that available. Because again, unless you're doing some kind of scripting inside your container, you don't even care what the shell is. But, I'm a little bit in on it. So I'm going to go through, and I'm going to make sure that we've got C++. The reason we want C++ support is C++ is a requirement for IDE6 being compiled into the kernel, or being compiled into the tool chain of the kernel that's around the file. So let's go ahead and add that. That makes sense. And by doing that, it unlocks a bunch of additional pieces. Now, let's also show packages that happen to be provided by BusyBox. Because the idea there is saying that if a package is provided by BusyBox, don't show it in the list. But by enabling that, it gives us the option of using upstream things that may be duplicated by BusyBox, but we can overlook them. And that's how we get things like being able to enable Bash as our shell, or Dash, or any of the others. So I'll add Bash. And then for my networking application, I'll add Bind. So at this point, I can exit out, and I can save. If I run make and start kicking that off, 
it will fully start compiling it from scratch. Like, I mean, to the tune of, it's going to download GCC and compile GCC so that you have GCC to compile everything else. Like, you will have built everything from source. There is nothing that you are pulling in as a binary artifact. And that's really interesting. It's really interesting because uh, recently, Debian has been working on having this idea of reproducible builds. The idea of a reproducible build is that if I download something like BusyBox, or sorry, something like Builder, and I'm going to pick on you, Lou, since you're sitting in the front row, and, and Lou were to download BusyBox, if we took the same config file with Builder and we ran that compile, we should be able to run MD5 sums of every file on both sides and validate it there to see. That's the idea of a reproduce function. And now that means that I can take someone else's code, I can compile it a few times to know that I trust their process, and then work with it. Or I know that if I have a distributed build system and I feed these artifacts into it, I feed this config file in to have it distributed locally and compiled in each data center, I can now validate that all of these are the same and there isn't anyone performing a man-in-the-middle attack. So, now one of the concerns that generally comes up is, well, if all of these things are being compiled from source, how do I know that they're safe? There's a few things there. So, build root itself is built around this idea of packages. Like, we saw that there was a menu for choosing packages. So, when I go into package, you know, I can go into bash, and there is just a make file. So when I look at bash.make, it tells me where the actual upstream sources even are. So in this case, there's a default GNU or mirror of all GNU software, so it knows just to go there, and it knows that it's retrieving that version. But on the other hand, if I were to look at Python, and you see there's a bunch of patches that are in Python. Also, that means that it's easy to patch the software in a way that you well, if that's a requirement. We see that in that case, they specify their upstream locations, and it's all defined as these variables. So like, if they release a new version, Builder hasn't gotten around to officially supporting it yet. As long as it's going to match that path, or I can fix up the main file to do it. And that's the nice thing, is that make files are one of those technologies First few times you use them, you just want to give yourself a prefrontal bomb. Like it's it's just not necessarily. But at the same time, it's a ubiquitous piece of technology. It's one of those things that you only have to learn once. And I'm a giant fan of things that you only have to learn once because knowing a make file is going to help you with this, it's going to help you build them for your own software. It also, because it's a standard piece of technology, means it's to hire people that understand that, or at least less hard to hire people that understand that. And it's, e it's an easier sell for folks who are getting started because you can say, yes, I realize that this thing is going to be annoying, but I can show you all the ways in which there's ongoing utility to it. Um, on top of that, uh, Builderit also supports pulling files directly or pulling artifacts directly from Git repositories, and you can even specify the commit hash that you want to pull from. So, like, I'm going to SSH into another host here. Uh, this is my actual build root host that I use for a lot. That's also a reminder, everybody has passwords on their SSH keys. Uh, so, similarly, I go into the default build root. And over here, this is where I've actually started building out the package for HAProxy. Like this. So this is one where I've decided Builder doesn't support HAProxy. I think it should support HAProxy. So I'm going to start the actual legwork to do it. So you know, I go through and create my configuration file, which stubs out the menu and says, hey, give it options of whether or not you want to support OpenSSL and whether or not you want to support uh, Perl compatible regular expressions. You know, and then 
I have here a file that defines the exact MD5 hash of what the sources should be. So now I can put in there what I have validated out of band that the hashes for all of my sources should be so that I can use them. Um, and then, like I said, the core part of it is just a make file where you know it goes through your standard build and all that. Now, another nice thing here is that the documentation is expansive. So if you have questions, one, there's plenty there to get you by, including they really want people to understand how to customize things for themselves, but also how to customize things to work with the upstream as well. So, they put a lot of effort into community building, as well as you know things like adding new packages to this. Like all of the documentation is there, so that you know you can do these things in one way, one time, and then be done with it. Not um, so this thing still compiling. I'm sure that you can trust me, since it was in the middle of doing the the main on that. What it actually gives you. Is it is going to go into slash output or into output images, and by default, it's going to give you a file called rootfs.tar. And you can take that rootfs.tar and do the same Docker import command that I showed you. Like it works perfectly. Um, one of the things that I have been abusing with Builder is that it's designed specifically for various hardware platforms. Like it's hardware agnostic. Like you saw all the different architectures that you can pull up in there. Like you can make compiles from ARM and stuff. So if you wanted to build your own custom Raspberry Pi distribution, this is great for doing it. So this is how like I built out this Raspberry Pi distribution with system D in it because I'm a system D junkie. I'm committed. This is my first meeting. Um, but yeah, in my configs here, actually let me go to the board first. When you're bringing up, and that's the actual term for it, bringing up a new platform or a new board on Linux, the idea is, is that you're going to have these specific rule sets talking about how you make changes. So like, when I'm trying to build something for the middle board max, I might need a specific configuration for the kernel that enables the exact hardware that I'm getting. Or I might need to do some specific things with my post -board. Now, all of these types of rules are actually defined in configs, where we have default configs for a lot of different stuff. So it also means that you can even build custom things to test out QEMU64. Like, that way you know you can build your own Linux distro that's going to work on that platform. Well, in here, you see that I've got these rules like Core Box, and Core Java, and Core Python. These are like, super short versions of the upstream config file. So the way that you get these files is you start out, you make the changes that you need to your .config file, which you should be doing with the menu driven things so that you don't have typos and stuff. And then you say make save def config. And there's even then an environment kind of option that you can hand to it of B R two death. I think I got the syntax right. Something that I always have to look up because I scripted it out a few times and then never think about it again. Um, but what it's doing is it's now taking that config that I curated and stripping out all of the default options. So now I have just the things I need that are different than that. And this is really cool because now that makes this config even more portable when you move to a new version of build or as new things get updated. Because now it's going to choose all of the new defaults when you load that back in. And it means that you can now take those. So if I took that and said copy ATX containers into configs ATX CDN def config, 
config. So I do that. I remove my config file. And then I say make the ATX CDN def config. And then it knows to look in that configuration file. It takes all of that, writes it out into everything, populates it all back in the defaults, and gets me back to a state where all of my configuration changes that I made of setting this to glibc and enabling the target package of, of bind, it's all there. So that makes it more portable as well. Now, on top of that, in my def configs that I've got, I do a few additional
this configuration directory in as Etsy bind, and this other configuration directory in as bar named, and then I want you to run name D in the foreground, like, you get bind running, bind is operation. <coughs> like, I can do digs against this, and I set this up as an actual uh, forwarder, so, Scroll way back. I need to grab my IP address. So, you know, if I were to say dig at post google.com, Initial copy. So there's 
some strange concerns like that that exist in copyright file systems. And really, those are bugs in the software that need to get fixed, less than most of the time bugs in the draft driver or the human file system. But if they're fixed, then the only downside is that we have a lot more software we have to Yes. But not in memory, not Correct. Correct. This is not, I will say, this is something that I'm trying to teach to the average user, but this is not something that the developer per se should care about. This is like when you get to production, like you want to make sure that only the things that you care about are actually there. Yes, you got a question? <clears throat> so, getting out of the art, because that's it's a super cool stuff, right? Um, and about half my time is spent doing stuff like this, so I'm going to have a really fun week. But the other half <laughs> is spent talking to people that actually physically get nauseous when they see a terminal. Yep. Um, but still, desperately want to take advantage of a lot of stuff that, that the containers have to offer, right? So we spend a lot of time building out and trying to come up with um, good base images that they can extend from that they give them a bunch of stuff, like attribution, like extended metadata, like built-in health that's not man-pages, yep. stuff like that. Taking this approach, we can drastically shrink the size of those base images in, in some cases. Um, but I mean, isn't that going to impact uh, kind of the overall usability? Or, I mean, it certainly gives us more problems because it's going to be harder for us to, um, like, do those automated builds, right? Which is the hardest thing, but we don't have to do it right now. Yep. Right? We're going to um, add a whole bunch of support. The number of base images that they're going to have to um, sift through and understand the implications of using are going to grow significantly, right? So, yep. I mean, this is awesome, but. Don't we kind of sacrifice the entire ecosystem that the doctors built out over the last couple of years by going this route? You might. You might. Okay, you got a question next, and we'll come back to it. <laughs> so suppose I go through the thing and um, haven't been doing a lot of low level work over the past few years. Yep. And so I can remove something that if I had a new York character in the office, no, don't. Uh, 